getting the price for it. For us in the conservation community, it's a bit more difficult to do that. But if you start doing this for yourselves, using a little bit of business language, it makes it much easier than to take them on that trajectory with you. And then, what's very important also is to be able to determine um, for yourself, what am I actually able to do? What kind of resources do I have available to me? And I've told that you see a few times. Don't engage in things where you know you can't deliver. Because your whole reputation, the whole view on the conservation community, on your organization will be impacted by that. So sometimes you have to be ready to say no as well. If they're asking you for a type of engagement that you don't feel comfortable with, or that you don't feel you have the resources or the expertise for. And I know that's difficult because engaging with business does include, you know, a funding the opportunity. But let's make sure that when you go and engage with business, there's a chance of delivery uh, at the end of uh, the exercise. Now this is really when you're doing your own work, looking at what is it that I can provide to business, how can I be attractive as a conservation organization to business. But there's the other part, is do I actually understand the partner? Do I actually understand the organization I'm going to work with? And that's very uh, important because that will help you make sure that you can address them with the correct topics and not bore them with generalities and theory which might not be of interest to them. And one of the easy things, and Jolene will, will probably touch a, uh, a lot uh, on that in, in the very last session, but Dean might do that when we talk about brand values as well, is just try to put yourself in the shoes of the business organization and see uh, what are their impacts and dependencies, you know, as a business, but also their impact and dependencies on the world that you know, the ecosystems, the biodiversity. Also, see, because that way you might actually be able to identify well, what are some of the opportunities for that business in conservation. What kind of conservation actions would actually be of interest to them? Because then there's a very likely um, a situation that what you offer them as suggested projects, suggested uh, engagements, will be very attractive to that organization. And the last point is hey, you want to gain something back from that engagement with business as well. What is it that business can do for you as a conservation organization? You know, there are skills, there are clearly a lot of competencies with this business that within the conservation community we don't have. So don't be shy of asking for that, because I'm sure that they are also being prepared to do the give and take situation. And then you're really going into an interaction that's not only one-sided, but it's both-sided. Okay. Any comments so far? Do you feel that that sounds like, yeah, I didn't necessarily think of that when I wanted to look at my engagement strategy. That, yeah? I just have one very small thing yeah. to, to add to that, Joe. I think in understanding the business, it's also really helpful to understand um, what the motivation of the business is for engaging. And I think, especially in larger businesses, um, there, there may be a number of motivations. It could well be that, um, well, there's certainly the organisation that I work with and the relationships that I'm involved in needs to get direct technical input into the development of policy and strategies and tools and implementation of projects on the ground. Um, there may be other companies who are interested in engaging in um, work with a topic uh, uh, way whereby they to do with uh, a conservation organisation that actually sits outside of direct impact of the business. There are other organisations that resource very heavily um, programs for conservation organisations and training up their employees. So I, I just, um, anyone who's interested in engaging with the business, I just really encourage them to do a little bit of homework and get a good sense of where the actual connect is and I think that could be very helpful. And we'll come back to some of these points when you're informalizing the agreement. Uh, there are clearly some, uh, some opportunities out there. Sorry. Sorry, I'm just 
just introduce yourself briefly because then people know yeah. who you are. Okay. So uh, my name is Samir Wadega and I just started with Run Life International and I will be I will be running the uh, real team to work with Run Life. Okay, sorry. Uh, so I'm just wondering, uh, coming from a conservation background, I always have doubts or these slight niggling doubts about engaging the corporates and everything. That I mean comes down to well, our in school as a conservationist and partly that's to do with trust, I feel that the, the way to build trust will come from really knowing business. And I was just wondering if I had anything more to say about how to build that trust and how to feel confident as conservationists that we're gonna be able to successfully engage with business without I mean, delivering value for both sides, but without sort of risk. Uh, I understand that question. I'm not going to answer it right now. I think one of our presenters might actually be, be touching a little bit on that. Um, trust doesn't come on the first day. It's, it's also a journey and it takes time. And it takes a lot of you know exchanges before you get really to a good trust level. So yes, you have to take some risk at the start. We'll talk about this uh, on that. Okay. Now once you the matching of the goals is fine. So you, you you know a little bit where you want to go and, and, and kind of organizations. But what is extremely important is that you have to find for yourself what's your strategy. Because you don't want to be derailed. As a conservation organization, you're standing for something. You want to make sure that it's out there and that you will get there. And you can bring some of the business engagements into that journey. So I've got three questions here. And I'd just like to hear from you. Why do you need a strategy? But what does it do? What does it provide to you? Uh, exercise and I'll 
explain a little bit in uh, IUC and how we did that. Uh, but that's also, you know, not a uh, thing that happens in one day. And, and the use of the strategy is then really in the, in the implementation. So I will use the business engagement strategy, uh, which is something that has been developed, uh, you know, over the last year. But there was a whole journey uh, behind this uh, uh, when this was created. And that was that back in 2004, uh, UCN started engaging with the business community. And this actually coincides very often with the Congresses. So it's in Bangkok, you know, you had some of the first businesses out there. And it was very interesting to hear that um, some delegates of business were in Bangkok, but they were kind of hiding behind cards of other organizations because they were not sure that they were that welcome here. There were actually only two or three companies that really visibly were having a booth Uh, then in Barcelona, uh, so the next Congress, there was a stronger presence. Actually, WBCSD already had a booth. Uh, what was it called? It was WBCSD booth, uh, Pavilion. Huh? Uh, oh yeah, E3. Huh? So it, was, um, it, it didn't have the word business really on that Pavilion, but there was a strong presence. There was, a, there was a you know, clearly area where business could meet and greet, but it wasn't integrated with the full program. And it was a time also where there were quite a lot of motions from members in stopping the engagement with the private sector. So there was clearly a mistrust or a distrust uh, in engaging with business. And that's really when the Council of IUCN requested for a new strategy uh, after Barcelona uh, Congress to actually come up with okay, we're engaging with business, but how are we, you know, making sure that we are not taken for a ride, that we are not, not just treated as consultants, and that we're just providing our knowledge, but that they will carry on and do the bad thing, you know. So um, the first concept was actually developed with members, and that's when you are saying how to develop a strategy. It's very important that this happens in a very consultative manner. Because then that way you're making sure that you know it is a strategy that's valid for all and valid for a long time. But you don't want to review your strategy too often. And so it involves IUCN members, councillors, and partners. So the ones that we've been working with, they were clearly involved in that process. And that was very important because the business engagement strategy by UCN is not in place right now, it's clearly building on the experience of the engagement with business since 2003. And then the first version was uh, uh, was produced, uh, and then that became uh, the the reason for uh, good uh, uh, interactions. Um, the final strategy was approved back in 2012, and um, this uh, strategy is really building on the experience that we had over time. I need to watch my time. Or I'm okay, but watching my timekeeper here. Now, what are these key elements of that strategy? It's clear aims and objectives. The clearer you are on these things, the easier it is to implement it. Okay? It still takes work to implement it. Huh? It's not because you've got a good concept and you've got a good you know, paper out there that seems to be well appreciated, well understood by the various stakeholders on both sides. You know, the conservation community and the business community. That's you know, it's there. No, there's still a lot of work that needs to happen in the implementation and the triggering it down in your organization, especially in an organization like IUCN. Because the business engagement strategy that was developed for IUCN is not for the business and biodiversity program only. It's for the whole of IUCN. We actually would like this to be helpful to the IUCN members as well. So there, as we say, the one aim is that we're really looking for demonstrable and transformational change. I don't know if you had the time to go to some of the world leaders dialogues, you know, from 5 to uh, 6.30 in the evenings, but there's been some very good panels there in plenary, and clearly we're hearing more and more a sense of urgency, the 
needs to move away from business as usual and, and, and the need to go for a radical change, for a transformational change. And that's really what's in the business engagement strategy of IUCN right now. It's not just to go for the incremental change. Incremental change, you don't need a big strategy for that. You know, that's what we've been doing uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. But what we're really trying to get is to get to transformational change. Really get nature at the center of some of the business decisions. Making sure that businesses are ready to challenge some of their business model. And also making sure that it's not only on a project or a site basis that we're starting to integrate biodiversity and ecosystem services, but it becomes a landscape approach. And it becomes an integrated approach with also perhaps some of the ecosystem services uh, elements and not just the biodiversity or the species uh, element. Now clearly the purpose, and I've alluded to that uh, earlier, the business engagement strategy has a very clear purpose, which is to provide a coherent framework for the whole of IUCN consistency. It was also to reassure IUCN Council that when we are engaging with business, we are trying to drive change, and we're not going to be taken on our right. So that was for IUCN very important that we did it that way. So the theory of change that we have, because now you're getting one level lower down, on how are we actually going to do that, are these three bubbles, you know, and we call them entry points because that's the way it, it, it spoke to the IUCN constituency, but, but we could have taken out the, the, the words entry points. We're saying, well, there is changes on the ground, how can you trigger changes on the ground, because in the end, if the changes are just happening in, in headquarters and discussions, that, that's no good, that, that, uh, that doesn't help. So how do you make sure that direct impacts are being mitigated, that net positive impact or no net loss activities are really happening and that biodiversity is gaining from some of these engagements. But then we also say, well, some of the companies don't have a direct impact. They're not all landholders, they're not all forestry companies, they're not biodiversity based businesses. Some of them have got large supply chains, and it's actually their customer or their supplier that are actually more impacted or dependent on biodiversity. And there are a lot of standards that are flourishing out there, and some of these standards are very really conducive to a world that values and conserves nature. So there we say there is a role for ACN to go in there and actually see on how can we ensure that sustainability criteria that do place nature really a part uh, of, of, of that discussions are being integrated. And uh, we'll have an announcement uh, later today on, on one of these initiatives that's clearly looking at the whole supply chain. Christophe might be talking a bit more about that. And the third one is what I would call the scale up. Can I come back? Well, yeah, just. Uh, thank you. I'm uh, Christine McKinsey from New When you say business practices, is that confined to the direct impacts on uh, the environment from that business running its business, or does it include business practices, meaning a business wanting to say engage in philanthropy? Thank you, very good question. Um, when this was designed, it excludes what we call sponsorship and licensing. So the philanthropic was completely excluded. Why? Because we say, well, philanthropy is only accepting money with nothing in return. Now, actually, one of the first actions I took when I took on my job in UCN is I say, I can't accept. We just accept money and not ask anything in return. So actually, uh, one of the first actions I took is I say, I want to look at all the sponsorship and licensing trying to see what is it that we can get in return. Uh, it's not because a large institution is ready just to make a large donation that we shouldn't be asking for any changes or commitment on their side as well. So it was excluded when it was actually created, but I, I do not think it's a good idea to completely separate the philanthropic from what we call programmatic engagement within IOC. That's a challenge because it was an easier way to get funding.
because we were not asking for anything in return. And I don't think that's good the reputation of IUCN if we knock too much from that. So thank you for that question. So the last point that I wanted to go into is the third entry point, is that the business engagement strategy is also very much about scaling up and making sure that we actually go in uh, outside of just the operations, but we really trying to set up the enabling environment so that actually it's not only the ones that on a voluntary basis are coming to IUCN to change the business practices to improve them and better integrate nature, but actually that you are able to create a new level playing field. And how do you do that? You do that with your engagement with policy and makers and a lot of the financial institutions. The lenders, the lenders of today, are determining under what conditions a project will be developed. Now I have to speed up because I'm realizing I'm talking a lot about business engagement strategy, but I'm not talking about the risk and opportunity side. So I'm going to flick through some slides more rapidly than planned. Uh, and I think this is important in selecting a business partner, but we want to make sure is that there's a good engagement concept. So that at the very beginning, you remember